Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on when you're watching this. Um, thank you for coming to this talk, which is in relation to the disposing of dead bodies and legalities thereof. My name is Elizabeth Wheeler. I'm a barrister at Hilda Dickinson in the Health Care and Public Law Group. Um, and if anyone was attending this thinking it was going to be some form of mafia description of what to do, then I apologise in advance. Um, it is very much about the law instead. In terms of this talk and the outline of the same, I hope it helps if I go through the types of issues that commonly arise and some general background information. I want to look at situations where no one is disposing of a body, disputes between family members, or where the disposal would offend the public. I will then go through a series of um, real life cases that have been decided by the courts over the last couple of centuries. That is not an in-depth guide to every single case, but merely a sampling of some that give the real um, summary of what the current law is on these matters. In terms of the first issue that commonly arises, one of the more common ones is that no one is disposing of the corpse at all for various reasons. The second one, which ones where we as lawyers are very often engaged, are where there are disputes between the family members as to disposal. And by family, I take a very wide approach of that, uh, not just the direct family, but other people who may have sufficient interest for various good reasons. And some of the cases will cover that. And there are also issues, albeit significantly rarer, surrounding how the disposal may cause public offence and the court's involvement and role in that as well. In terms of some general principles, one of the most fundamental, and it'll be looked at in a little bit more detail, is that there is no property in a corpse. What is meant by that is while people can be in lawful possession of a corpse, that lawful possession is as a right of some form of duty to do something with the corpse. Unlike other aspects of a deceased estate, be it their houses, their cars, their jewellery, their books, etc., their actual body is not property which can be disposed of. It's therefore quite different from other aspects of their estate. I do pause there because there are various exemptions to this, and these are not discussed in detail in this. These include where parts of the body have been developed in such a way with care or artistry or some form of industry. There are also examples relating to gametes, for example, and indeed whole corpses which have been subject to additional works. If you need advice on those, we're happy to provide. But in general, we're talking about bog standard corpses where it is simply, sadly, the body of deceased person. The other phrase that will come up significantly is the lawful and decent disposal. Historically, back in the 19th century or so, that was burial, full stop. The only real choice was between consecrated or unconsecrated ground and some funeral arrangements. Cremation was not legal in the UK until some time later. Nowadays, very often, the general uh, three options are burial, cremation, or removal of the body abroad. Again, this body does, this talk doesn't touch on the latter. It does deal with issues where there are disputes between burial and cremation, and the ceremonies and rituals surrounding those, as well as location. In general terms, all of this talk applies once the coroner's rights have been exhausted. Because if the coroner it comes to know about someone who has died in their jurisdiction, their geographical jurisdiction, and where they believe they may have to investigate to hold an inquest for the various reasons, they are the person who has primary rights to possession of the body and no one else's rights, whether they be executors or administrators, can take effect until the coroner has released the body. One of the later cases I will look at will look at a case where the coroner isn't quite sure who to release the body to because there is an ongoing dispute. And so it does look into those situations. But by and large, it should be presumed in most of these examples that the coroner has authorised the release of the body. In other words, they no longer need it for the purpose of their investigations, regardless of the event. It is important to note that there is a distinction 
between a death in which there are executors, in other words, the deceased has made a will, and a death in which there is no will, in which case there are only administrators. The reason that that is important is various rights come into effect immediately, and or instead duties come into effect immediately on the death of the deceased for executors. However, for administrators, things can be a little bit more complex. In any event, it will also be seen that in some of the later cases that I look at, where there are disputes over the validity of the will, that can cause into account um, issues with who the executor is and what their rights are in that respect. I do note at this point that, of course, a will can only be made by an adult. So anyone who dies under the age of 18 automatically won't have a will. They may have expressed wishes and feelings, as may many of adults. Those are relevant to a degree, and again, those will be looked at. But ultimately, there is a distinction between an executor and an administrator. And therefore, if you're dealing with an issue, say you are from a hospital trust and you are aware that the family have a dispute about who should get to arrange the funeral, for example, one of the questions you need to ask yourself, well, and ask the family is, is there a will? Who is the executor? Clearly, that doesn't need to be asked for children again because they won't have a will. So in terms of the types of scenarios that we're looking at, the first one um, is that no one is disposing of the body. It is a common scenario in these types of cases that the deceased may have died many months or in fact many years before is in the hospital mortuary and no one has come forward to offer the deceased a lawful and decent disposal. So one of the things I will be looking at is what are the options for the hospital at that point? They clearly can't keep the deceased indefinitely in their mortuary. So what are the next steps that should be done? One consideration in that scenario, of course, is to invite the local authority to exercise their powers. The local authority's powers come under section 46.1, um, and I quote it here, it shall be the duty of a local authority to cause to be buried or cremated the body of any person who has died or being found dead in their area, in any case where it appears to the authority that no suitable arrangements for the disposal of the body have been or are being made otherwise than by the authority. It is important to note, of course, that it is very much the local authority who decides that. Their duty is only engaged if they themselves say, consider it appears that no suitable arrangements for the disposal of the body are being made. If family members are attempting to make those arrangements, albeit that there's a dispute, or the hospital are trying to make those arrangements, for example, the local authority may well take a step back on things and say there are arrangements being made, it's just they're in dispute at the moment. But in essence, essentially, if the hospital has a mortuary, a body in their mortuary, and simply no one is doing anything, it's worth liaising with the local authority in the first instance to find out what the options are. I should pause at this stage to say as a matter of practicality, if a hospital trust, for example, takes on uh, the disposal of the body for whatever reason, it's going to be really important to give, make good records in relation to that and always consider that there is a bereaved family out there somewhere who may well want, may want details of this someday. For the local authority, their duties are set out within that law. They will have various process procedures to deal with to call public health barriers. Um, so to give an example of disputes between family members, for example, the deceased has died with a will. There are two executors in the will. They disagree whether the deceased should be buried, executor one, or cremated, executor two. Um, again, if you're in the position of saving the hospital trust and the body is in your mortuary, it's going to be a challenge to know what to do. The biggest piece of advice I always give with all of these is don't rush into anything. Take the time that you need to decide things, take the time that you need to seek legal advice to clarify the facts, etc. It is far better to spend a short while getting things right at the beginning than to make a decision that then has repercussions that can't be undone further down the line. In terms of the discussions of that scenario, with any family dispute over disposal, the other thing to bear in mind is that the family are almost certainly grieving. 
there may well be various historic aspects within that family and disputes and long histories that we don't know about or only have the partial side of it. But with all dealings with all families in all of these cases, do bear in mind that they are a grieving family and treat them with respect and compassion as appropriate. Very often in these cases, although I will be look, talking about a lot that have ended up in court, it is always worth bearing in mind that ultimately compassion and pragmatism are often the better solution to law. In almost all situations, most lawyers would prefer not to go to court on matters on behalf of their clients. And in this case in particular, grieving families need time to process things and the court process quite simply doesn't normally help. However, if compassion and pragmatism aren't enough, then we need to look at what the court options are. One of the questions that often arises is who takes this to court? Um, that's going to depend, quite frankly. It's going to depend on the particular situation, the desire, of, for example, the hospital trust to be disposing of the body in their mortuary, depending on the amount of time, whether the dispute between the family members could be resolved relatively quickly. For example, a relatively simple dispute could be resolved quite quickly by the courts by emergency injunctions. However, a longer dispute about, for example, the validity of a will is likely to take some significant time, hopefully not as long as, say, Bleak House or a Dickensian saga with Jandis and Jandis, but it can take some time. And in the meanwhile, the body is still there. It is not being lawfully or properly or decently disposed of. And the courts will bear in mind those factors when considering their options and the judgment that they'll give. In terms of this scenario, ultimately, court could, for example, say it's for executor one to arrange the disposal or executor two to arrange the disposal or indeed the hospital trust, depending on who has applied and who has asked for what. And we'll get into a few more details about those and some practical considerations later in the court, later in the talk, when I've gone through a few more of the real life case examples. Scenario two, the deceased as a child, therefore inherently died without a will. Mum and dad, both of whom have parental responsibility, are divorced and cannot agree on a lawful and decent disposal. How is this resolved? And again, start with compassion. Um, this one may well have an acrimonious divorce in the background. It's clearly a made up scenario. But again, if that doesn't work, there needs to be considerations to go to court. And again, considerations to who is bringing the case, what are the court's options? And that will be very fact specific. The reasons why mum and dad may be, excuse me, I'm on button, may be disputing things can have a myriad of reasons behind it. On the more acceptable side, it may be, for example, different religious beliefs or different genuine beliefs as to the best way to dispose of their child's body, whether burial or cremation or chirogenics or, or, or something similar. At the other end, it may be that one of them is accusing the other of some very serious allegations in which the body to be preserved to prove or disprove those. So there can be a myriad of reasons why the body is not being disposed of. And that's why I don't say at this point, this is what would happen or this is not what would happen. You see the cases coming through the court, the differences there. But the questions that will need to be asked, if that's a compassionate and pragmatic resolution to their is, Consideration of who brings the case, under what grounds, what are the court's options? Again, if you are an NHS hospital trust, what are you asking the court to do? And that's going to be the really important question. Looking at some case law, therefore, the first one I turn to um, goes back to the th third uh, topic that I raised about offending the public. And this is very, very rare indeed. Perhaps the rarity can be attested to by the fact that case I'm talking about is Ian Brady. I suspect everyone listening to this will know who he is, but for those who don't, he was one of the notorious Moore's murderers who, with his partner, killed a very murdered um, a very large number of children some decades ago. And there were ongoing issues where he refused to explain where the bodies were buried, et cetera, et cetera. He's very much been public eye um, throughout the rest of his life, throughout the time of jail. He died. 
and ended up in a hospital trust mortuary. He died having made a will naming Mr. Macon, who had been his lawyer throughout his life, as his executor. There were concerns that arose, it's not entirely clear how, about the plans for the disposal of the body. These included rumours that the ashes would be spread on Saddleworth Moor. And again, in terms of the um, reason that was so serious, is that is where a number of the bodies of his victims were buried. And he was associating his notoriety with that area. The local authority therefore sought assurances from Mr. Macon, the lawyer, and the executor that the body would not be disposed of this way. These were not given. Mr. Macon took the view that actually the disposal of the body as the executor was a matter for him and was no concern to anyone else. Um, through lengthier correspondence, but that was the essence of it. He had given some assurances to the coroner, but didn't repeat these to the local authority. The other matter that came up was what music would be played. Um, Mr. Brady had asked for a very macabre music involving the serial killer being haunted by his victims in the afterlife. Again, what we see the inherent insensitivity of that. Um, in light of all of that, and after prolonged and protracted correspondence, the local authority took the matter to court. It's important to note that there are multiple local authorities involved here. Um, Sefton MBC is where the body was at the time of his death. The local authority that initiated the application was Oldham, and the reason for that is Saddleworth Moor is within their jurisdiction, in essence. Um, there are also then other parties involved in this litigation, including Mr. Macon himself and various hospital trusts, um, etc., in relation to that. In essence, what the court did was exercise its powers under Section 116 of the Senior Courts Act. What this allows the court to do is displace executors and administrators um, in various ways. And again, I'll get into it in a bit more detail. And the court took the rare step of not only displacing Mr. Macon, but also specifically saying how the body should be disposed of. Generally, when 116 is used, what the court simply says is we're displacing person A in favour of person B and person B then has the right of responsibility to make the arrangements. In this case, the court was quite prescriptive on the arrangements given the circumstances. So, the finality, although this is clearly an unusual situation, the court's decision was that the body would be cremated in a spare cremator outside of normal hours. No music was to be played. There was to be no ceremony or laughter. There were to be no flowers or photographs. The list of people who could attend was extremely limited, and the ashes were to be disposed of at sea. And again, the list of attendees there was extremely limited. So, in this case, you can see that the court, again, particularly because of the notoriety and the issues that had arisen, took quite a prescriptive attitude. And that's when I say about the, the method of disposal making was offence. This is the only case I know of which has been so stringent in this manner. Section 116 will come up quite a lot in some of the other cases. The next cases I'm taking you through are in time order rather than any order of importance, and that's because they build on one another. There is an entire bank of Victorian case law which decides many of the baseline principles of these cases. It is important to note a few things. Firstly, that at the time many of the Victorian cases were decided on, cremation was not an option. The only option for disposing of a body was burial due to the religious and social mores at the time. The other thing to be mindful of, and this particularly arises Williams and Williams, is just bearing in mind uh, the law relating to restricting the rights of different sexes to do different things. Um, in this case, which I have to confess I quoted for years in many cases, and then only recently I actually had to come to look at the facts of it, which are far more salacious than I had thought. In this case, the deceased had directed in a codicil to his will that he be cremated and that his female friend, W, be responsible for doing so. I pause here to note that the deceased, in fact, had a wife, had children, 
and was Roman Catholic, and that's relevant again, bearing in mind the year of this case, 1880. So we are further back in time. The established church is still far more established than perhaps today. So he sent a letter to his female friend W with a codicil to the will in it. There's no dispute on this, the evidence is very clear. And what he essentially said is he wanted to be cremated and then his ashes placed in a Wedgwood jar, which then, sorry, which he sent to her. Um, he also said that she would be recompensed for arranging this. Instead, his executors arranged for him to be buried in unconsecrated ground. That might sound bad, but part of the ritual of the time, again, bearing in mind he was Roman Catholic, involved a Catholic priest giving a blessing over the grave, various other rituals being done, which from the judgment were clearly the common way to bury Roman Catholics in England and Wales at that time. The case then develops because the deceased female friend W then asks essentially to dig up his body. And the court say, why? And she says, oh, it's so I can bury him in consecrated ground. Um, bearing in mind the court said, you're absolutely not going to cremate him, are you? And she said, oh, no, I'm definitely not going to cremate him. I, I paraphrase slightly. So the court gave her the license to exhume the body, and this was therefore done. Um, Properly, she takes it off to Italy, where she does get it cremated and puts the ashes in the aforesaid Wedgwood vase. This case all then came to court because when she came back, she sued the executors for the cost of doing this. In other words, the trip to Italy, the cremation, etc. And the basis on which she, she sued the executors for the cost of this is that she was acting in line with the wishes of the deceased. Again, I, I pause there. She lost her case. I pause there to note that the court was really explicit that absolutely these reflected the wishes of the deceased. It was in writing, it was indisputable. The court also ruled that she had absolutely acted in good faith and with goodwill. She genuinely believed it was her duty to carry out the wishes of the deceased. However, the court held that a direction by the deceased as the disposal cannot be enforced. So that's crucial. Until very recently, and I will discuss that case as well, ultimately, whatever the articulated wishes of the deceased was, it is for the executors to arrange the funeral and the disposal of the body. In addition, what the court ruled is that there is no property in a corpse, in a dead body, but the executors do have a right to the possession of the body for the purpose of proper and lawful disposal. And that goes back to what I was saying right at the beginning of this talk. Um, the next case, therefore, we do skip about a century forward. There were lots of cases which basically upheld Williams and Williams and the principles therein and that developed the case law on top of that. In this case, the deceased died in hospital and the coroner ordered a post-mortem. As part of this post-mortem, the brain was removed and fixed. Um, it was specially treated, in essence. The deceased body was returned to her family and buried, and the brain was stored by the hospital. Later, the hospital disposed of the brain. Three years later, the deceased's mother took out letters of administration because the deceased had died without a will and sued the hospital for disposing of the brain. The deceased mother lost her case. The reason for that is, again, we go back to there is no property in the corpse. So unlike, say, if the deceased had been wearing a diamond necklace, the hospital disposed of that, that property is part of the deceased's estate and therefore can be sued for. There are circumstances where you can sue for, for a body, but this isn't one of them. In addition, the executors and administrators are charged with the duty of the disposing of the body and had the rights of the possession of it until it was properly buried. But on this one, we need to look at the order of events because what happens is the deceased dies, is then buried, and it's only later that mother was appointed as the administratrix of the estate. So the significance there is that order of events because it means that at the time that the brain was removed and preserved, the mother was not yet 
didn't yet have those letters of administration. And that goes back to that distinction I mentioned before between someone dying with a will and having executors, where many of the rights and responsibilities take place immediately without needing the court to do anything, and a case where there isn't a will. And so technically, many of the rights and responsibilities would need the court to grant uh, letters of administration, etc. Generally, it will often not matter. If there is no, let's say someone dies without a will, there is clearly no dispute at all between the family as to disposal. This doesn't matter in that case. But in any case where there is a dispute or potential for a dispute, it's worth just taking that step back and again checking if there are will, if so, if not, what is the actual situation. Continuing on the case of Dobson, what the court said is that the lawful removal and preservation of a brain in the course of a post-mortem did transfer it into an item into which the mother had a right of possession. But the legal obligation of the doctor under the then coroner's rules to preserve material did not continue after the coroner had ascertained the cause of death. And so therefore the mother lost her case in this respect. The next case, only two years later here, so 1999, um, this is a one with a really sad and complex history. Buchanan and Milton. The deceased was of Australian Aboriginal origin, and he was given up for adoption immediately after birth. It became apparent that the mother had signed the papers four days after birth, and this was in the 70s. So the court made various criticisms of the process at the time, which I'll be dealing with as well. In any event, though, he was given up for adoption. And he was brought to the UK at the age of six um, in 1979 by his adoptive parents. In 1996, he made contact with his birth mother in Australia. At that point, he was labelled as part of the stolen, as a potentially stolen child, part of the stolen generation. And what was happening, unfortunately, at that time is that there was pressure on Aboriginal mothers and other women of colour to give up their children to white families as part of a process of assimilation. That generation um, was called the stolen generation. Um, and the Australian government in the early 90s took steps to try and rectify things in terms of significantly changing adoption law. But by that stage, the family was already back in the UK, saying they'd moved back to the UK in 1979. He met his mother and came into contact with his birth family. He travelled to Australia to meet them and then came back to the UK. It is very apparent on the papers that he was tremendously disturbed by being labelled a stolen child or part of the stolen generation. I haven't really processed this. It was something he called, caused him a whole amount of distress. Not apparently in the sense of having lost his original heritage, but the idea that he might have been stolen when clearly he had a very loving and close bond with his adoptive family. It's notable and important for the case that once he returned to the UK, he had little further contact with his birth mother. On his death, when his belongings were being looked at, he didn't even have co contact details listed in his address book for his birth family, for example. Sadly, in 1998, so just two years after his contact, he died in a car accident, aged just 26. The year before, he had had a daughter with his partner. The daughter was called Holly. And so at the time of his death, she was one year old. She was therefore, under the intestacy rules, because he died without a will, the only person entitled to his estate. Because he died in the estate, and because she was a minor, only being one years old, that meant that there had to be two administrators um, put in place to, to assist with that. The first one was her mother, and her mother appointed the deceased's adopted mother as the other administrator. Holly's mother, so the child's mother, and the deceased's adopted mother made arrangements for cremation. And things were going fine, and then these were delayed when the birth mother, the, the birth mother and birth family had been told about these plans and fairly promptly expressed a real amount of upset and part of the reason for that is that in Aboriginal culture 
they don't cremate their dead. And it's really important for the dead to be brought back to their place of birth for spiritual and religious and cultural reasons. The birth mother and her family articulated this and therefore by consent initially, the Holly's mother and the deceased adopted mother, the administrators, I'm going to call them, put things on hold for a bit. Um, they planned in line with the birth family's uh, wishes to send the body back to Australia to be buried in line with the birth family's customs and traditions. However, there was then a series of events that led them to change their mind. They found out more about the nature of the customs and traditions and weren't wholly comfortable with that. They also weren't comfortable that the only part of his heritage that was being recognised was his Aboriginal heritage and not the heritage with which he'd grown up in his, birth, in his adopted family's heritage. On top of that, it appears that there were a series of falling out or miscommunication surrounding various customs where members of the birth family had attended the UK to undertake some of the rituals. And in the course of that, the adopted family had the impression that the spirit of the deceased's adopted father was being blamed for the car accident in one way. By the court case, it wasn't really clear what the truth of it was, but that very much was their perception on things. So the arrangements broke down. And as a result, it went to court. The birth mother made an application that Holly, the child, should be displaced as administrator and that the birth mother should act instead. And the basis of that goes back to that application we've talked to before, section 116. And that was on the basis that there were special circumstances. That included the Aboriginal heritage of the deceased, the fact that from the mother, birth mother's perspective, he was part of the stolen generation, albeit that that was very much a matter of ongoing dispute, and that therefore he'd been denied his heritage by being stolen away. The adopted family opposed this um, and said that their, their arrangements for burial should take precedence instead and that Holly should remain an administrator of the state. Ultimately, the court refused the birth mother's application. It did agree with her that there were special circumstances in this case. And it also agreed that contrary to some suggestions in some earlier case law, that special circumstances included all relevant circumstances, not just issues to do with the estate. Therefore, factors such as the deceased Aboriginal heritage and the flawed circumstances of his adoption and other various factors did combine and were unusual enough to make this case special. But the test for 116 isn't just special circumstances. The second part of the test is whether it's necessary or expedient to displace. And on this particular fact, the court said it wasn't. They noted that the deceased had not embraced his Aboriginal heritage. And they did get expert opinion on this. And the expert in essence said that for the deceased to be Aboriginal, he had to not only come from that background, but he needed to see himself as an Aboriginal man. Now, the first part of that was clearly made out, he came from that background. But from the actions of the deceased of being, of being aware of his heritage and all the evidence how he saw himself, the evidence is that he saw himself as a mixed race UK citizen rather than anything else. Um, the court also found that the adopted family also had the right to lay him to rest in a manner that was appropriate to them, notwithstanding the birth mother's justifiable anger at the loss of the deceased's heritage. And the court was clearly very perturbed by the um, systems and processes in place for adoption in Australia of children of this heritage back in the 70s. Uh, it described this later as flawed, um, which is probably a reasonable articulation of things. So that's a good example of where there are material conflicts between the family and the sort of factors court takes into account and say it looks at the big picture, not merely things to do with the deceased estate. The next case is a 2006 case and that's University College London Lewisham NHS Foundation Trust. Um, in this case, the deceased had lived in a nursing home prior to his death 
And whilst he was there, he made a will naming his nurse H as his executor. It's become clear that there were loads of very substantive financial gifts to H, and I think anyone listening can see the potential uh, concerns in relation to that relationship and power balances, capacity to make decisions, etc. Um, the deceased was quite clear that he wished to be cremated, and he left the nursing home, went to Lewisham Hospital, where he died. Following his death, H, the nurse who was the executor in the will, asked for the body to be released so that she could cremate it in line with the deceased wishes. So far, so straightforward. There is a will, she's following his wishes, seems fine. But the rest of the family, who I'm just going to call X because they cover names 2 to 13 in terms of this case, the rest of the family, X, opposed this. They wanted the body to be buried in the family plot and there was a dispute over the validity of the will, mainly over whether he had the capacity to create the will he created. The result of this, therefore, though, was that there was therefore a dispute about whether H was a valid executor in this will or not. Because if the will isn't valid, then he dies in test date, and therefore we go back to the no will situations that we've had before. These ongoing disputes meant that no one was arranging for the lawful and decent disposal of the body. It was stuck in the hospital's mortuary whilst these were ongoing. And disputes over wills are not quick to resolve. They take a very long time. So the trust applied to the court for an order under common law that it had the right to dispose of the body. So it didn't apply under Section 116, which we've seen earlier. The trust succeeded in its application. Under common law, again, going back to 19th century, possibly 18th century cases, there is a duty on the householder to arrange the decent disposal of a person who has died under its roof. If, if, if a person in relation to, if, in essence, if no other person is doing this. So if other people have that right and responsibility here, the executor, the family, but are not doing that, then the householder has that duty instead. In this situation, uh, the trust is the householder and the deceased had died under their roof. Therefore, the trust was in lawful possession of the body. As indicated before, there was no way to resolve the dispute about the will in any acceptable time period. And therefore, the arrangements for disposal were left in the hands of the person currently in lawful possession of the body namely the trust. The court therefore declared that the trust had the right and the responsibility to ensure the disposal of the deceased's body. The next case is a sad case of a 15-year-old who died by suicide. He'd been brought up by his uncle with his mother having little contact. There is evidence of substance misuse and other chaotic features in her life. There had been increased contact with his mother in the last year of his life. He was 15, so L has died without a will, but he had said that he wanted to be cremated. Normally, in the list of in the non-contentious probate rules, if someone has died without a will, the parents of the deceased would be of a higher priority in terms of making arrangements than an uncle or an aunt or similar of the deceased. Here, the mother wanted him buried. The uncle wanted him cremated in line with his wishes. The court ruled that firstly, it would be very rare for the order of priority in non-contentious probate rules to be displaced. So that is always the starting point. However, the court also said that the views of the deceased as to the funeral arrangements should be taken into account and that these could amount to special circumstances for the purpose of an application under section 116, so that same bit that we talked about earlier. In addition, the court looked at the human rights element of things and said that under Article 8, which is the right to private family life, that could also be a relevant consideration. The reason the coroner appears here is that he wasn't releasing the body 
until he could work out who to release it to, but he knew there was this ongoing dispute. And so what the court has also said is that if it appeared to a coroner that there may be a legal challenge as to whom they should release, as to whom they should release the body to, the coroner would need to delay the release of the body for a short time to allow the parties to make an urgent court application. From experience, in cases like this, applications can be heard the same day or the next day because it's that urgent. The courts do have the facility to deal with that. Some of these cases where there's less urgency can take significantly longer. In terms of the next case, 2009, this is Lakey and Medway NHS Foundation Trust. In this case, the deceased died of cancer whilst at Medway Hospital, and four years later, her body was still, sadly, in the hospital morgue. Um, she had a husband, so there's no dispute as to who had the initial right and responsibility there. This is one of those cases that goes back to the first example I gave in many ways, which is no one is disposed of. The husband had claimed that her death was as a result of negligence and wanted a coroner's inquest and also wanted the GMC to investigate. And he was therefore, frankly, point blank, refusing to make arrangements for disposal until this was done. And that was despite regular requests from the trust for the body to be disposed of in a lawful and decent way. The husband asserted that he was under no obligation to dispose of the body for three reasons. Firstly, he wanted the inquest. Secondly, he had an outstanding complaint to the GMC. And thirdly, there was an agreement between him and the trust to preserve the body whilst the disputes were being mediated. The court refused the husband's application, saying that he did, well, someone had a duty and that his grounds were wrong. In relation to the first ground, they said it was too late for the inquest. Uh, the coroner had said it was natural causes to close things. The second ground, which was the GMC are doing an investigation, they said that wasn't a good enough reason because the decomposition of the body meant that there was no useful material that could be used for the GMC's case. And on the third point, what the court said that was that even if there was an agreement between the trust and the husband, then actually the trust could terminate this at any point by giving reasonable notice. The court therefore, I should go back on the page, sorry, the court therefore gave the trust the right to dispose of that body against the householder principle on it because no one else was disposing of it. Just in terms of some final practicalities, therefore, I, I go back to what I said before, which is always start with the position of being compassionate and being pragmatic. If a dispute arises, there is generally the time to do things properly, talk to the family members, give them the space, most acute trusts have a bereavement team or similar who are very, very experienced in dealing with bereaving families. So take the time to do this. Take the time to see if a pragmatic, non-court-based solution can be sought. If that is not possible, then I do advise seeking legal advice. Don't give over the body on the basis that someone is claiming they have a right if you're unsure about it. It's important to get it right, because if it isn't got right at the early stage, things can get significantly worse down the line. So seek legal advice. These cases can be both complex, but can be dealt with very quickly in some circumstances. And the final piece of advice that I have, again, arising out of inquiries we've had, is that if your hospital is in possession of the body when no one is claiming it because family can't be identified for one reason or another. And if the particular circumstances mean it is the hospital who is disposing of the body, bear in mind that there will be a family out there somewhere. And it is a good idea to make a note, patient's notes, for example, on what arrangements have been made and in particular, any attempts to personalise this to the deceased. That means that if the family does come back, the hospital can show that it's been compassionate um, and it's been person-centred in how it's dealing with this. And the final point is this, that if you as an organisation are considering applying to court 
to take over the disposal of the body. One thing that I have found very helpful is active considerations to exactly what you intend to do. Is it going to be burial? Is it going to be cremation? What steps are going to be done to ensure, for example, music, flowers, attendees? Did the deceased have a favourite football team? Were they particularly a fan of a particular colour? Again, those personal aspects of it. And because the court has found it much easier to make decisions granting a trust's application to dispose of the body when there's been a lot of detail about what the trust proposes to do and particular detail about how the trust continues to want to engage the family in these matters. So it's helpful to have a consideration of that and be willing to put it in a statement that can be put before the court to explain those arrangements. We deal with these inquiries fairly regularly. They are always sad and difficult on their own facts. But from a legal point of view, there are therefore a number of pathways and routes that can be done to create a resolution that works as best as possible for everyone. So if you need any further information or advice, then please do contact me or our wider team. My details are on that final slide. And I hope that this talk has been helpful to everyone. Um, I leave just a final slide about the firm as a whole, but if I can help at all, or our team can help at all, please just get in contact and do our best to help you achieve a the most painless resolution that we can for everyone. Thank you very much for listening to this talk. Goodbye.